Well, thank you very much. Um, I must say, um, you really uh, overdid it. Uh, about half of the praise you gave me was uh, invented. Um, the other half uh, I accept with humility, um, but I think I should, uh, in the interest of transparency, you should admit that uh, you really overstated what I have done in my very short life. I'm only last week I was uh, 77, uh, and uh, so nobody can achieve all the things which you claimed I have done. But um, I am tremendously excited to be here, I must say, to be, to be welcomed uh, by uh, Professor Ildiv um, at this uh, fantastic university. I mean, this building is great. I just learned that it's about 150 years old. Um, and uh, it um, makes me even um, more uh, moderate in my, in my visit here, in my approach to you. Um, I am tremendously uh, honored by the support of the European Union, of UNDP, uh, and I'm very, very grateful for uh, the participation of Mrs. Uh, Nikolova. I was really impressed by the approach uh, you dis described to me and to us um, about uh, how you are dealing with corruption in, in this country. All of this um, is very exciting. Um, it's very exciting also because um, I have been following with great interest what our uh, Transparency International uh, chapter has been doing for many, many years now. Uh, this chapter is probably one of the most um, uh, senior chapters in our movement. We have now 110 chapters worldwide. And uh, therefore, to come here and visit you and see uh, the chapter in its own natural habitat is uh, very exciting. And to be invited uh, to the uh, Kapuczynski Development uh, Lecture Program um, is um, also quite um, uh, topical right now. I remember having read something uh, f uh, about the northern barbars, which I guess the Germans and the northern Europeans were, as compared to the civilization which existed uh, in the south of Europe. And I find this particularly interesting at a time when I'm afraid the northern Europeans are mistreating some of the southern Europeans, the Greeks, in connection with the financial crisis uh, in a rather barbaric way. And I hope that uh, uh, this uh, gives us a special sense of responsibility of talking uh, at a lecture which carries the name of Mr. Kapuczynski. Now, all of this together um, makes me uh, wonder what um, would be the best approach to using this, um, this privilege to address you. Um, I would perhaps want to put my support um, to um, fighting corruption into the context of the support of uh, organized civil society uh, to good global governance. Uh, because uh, corruption is just one part of uh, bad global governance. It is partly the reason for bad global governance, but it's also the result of bad global governance. Uh, and I would like to perhaps uh, put what I'm going to talk about today, mainly because of my experience with Transparency International, but also some other transparency organizations into this context. Um, because I really fear that we are facing uh, what one can call in the globalized economy, in, in the world at large, which one can call failing governance. Uh, many of us uh, apply this term to failed states like the east of the Democratic Rep uh, Republic of Congo, uh, to Syria uh, some time ago, to uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia and so on. But we very rarely apply this to the world at large uh, and the governance of um, a globalized economy which seems to have escaped the primacy of uh, politics, the capacity of society to shape the markets, to shape the global markets, rather being uh, shaped by the markets, rather than becoming an appendix to the market forces which are operating at a global level and um, to which our present governance system seems to be uh, quite inadequate. 
So what I would like to talk about is basically uh, the fact, in my opinion, that our present paradigm of global governance is inadequate, that it is not able to deal with a world which uh, is global, in particular in its economic, but also in its cultural and, and uh, political uh, dimensions. And um, uh, which reminds me, say, uh, coming from a football nation like Germany, uh, to a football field in which you have uh, different referees um, uh, in charge of different parts of the football field. In one field, they apply the rules of baseball, in other fields, the rules of basketball, in other fields, the rules of, of rugby, in other areas, um, the holy rules of football. And of course, in a situation like that, you cannot possibly have a good game in which uh, the, um, the teams can, um, can show what they are able to, uh, to, to achieve. So this is our present system of global governance, uh, a system which is based on the primacy of sovereign states and their national governments. Uh, they are the main pillars of our present formal system of governance. And uh, my observation is, um, and that observation of many other people, that um, this um, system simply doesn't work anymore. Um, the, uh, there are at least uh, what I call three um, asymmetries uh, which make it so difficult for national governments to do their work. The first one is that, of course, they don't have the global reach which they would need in order to regulate a global market. Um, the large uh, actors of the international markets, large multinational corporations, but also small um, enterprises um, uh, which are uh, participating in the international marketplace are operating across borders. For them, borders are just one element of their strategies, of their tactics, of uh, maximizing their, their uh, profits and uh, minimizing uh, their risks. And um, uh, therefore, uh, for the state to regulate um, uh, this uh, multitude of economic actors uh, is uh, impossible. Um, uh, so this is the first asymmetry, is the geographic um, reach of uh, national governments. Uh, the second one is the time horizon of national governments. In particular, in democracies, the time horizon of uh, decision makers is two or three years from one election to the next, when um, they have to serve their constituencies in order to make sure that they are re-elected, that they can maintain power. Now, um, the time horizon of the issues of global governance are is much longer. I mean, if you talk about climate change, if you talk about environmental destruction, if you talk about poverty alleviation worldwide, if you talk about war and um, human rights violations, if you want to deal with these issues, you have to have much longer time horizon. And, um, and of course, as um, uh, we have heard earlier, we are now at the end of a slightly longer period of time, the end of the uh, global development goals, um, and we are now trying to design uh, soon in a uh, summit in, in New York a longer time horizon, um, the sustainable development goals for the post-2015 period. But again, these are time zones which are so, so much different from the reality of global governance that um, uh, the incentives and sanctions which come uh, with these time horizons are simply out of whack uh, with um, the reality which has to be regulated. And then, of course, uh, these constituencies which national governments have to serve are dispersed, are uh, very particularistic, uh, and uh, therefore um, they are not the um, constituencies which are necessary to make sure that a world is created, a global reality is created which is more just and uh, more peaceful and more sustainable. Now, this is um, the reason. These are the three, in my opinion, important reasons why our um, uh, present system of national government-based uh, global governance uh, is inadequate because, uh, uh, of course, these national governments have the same um, interests in mind, the same constraints when they operate 
as members of uh, intergovernmental organizations like the United uh, Nations, like uh, the World Bank, like the IMF, like regional institutions. So in many ways, they translate their own parochial interests into a lowest common denominator in many of these organizations, uh, which are therefore, as we can observe, um, uh, inept and incapable of really creating a global governance which is acceptable. Because the reality which we have right now, the result of this uh, failing global governance, is unacceptable. If you look at a, a system where we have uh, a billion people uh, living in the world below the absolute poverty line, if we have uh, uh, about a billion people uh, where, which have uh, inadequate access to, uh, to drinking water, about two billion people living in the world without sanitation and so on, and therefore uh, the women and children uh, in these societies uh, die of the most banal poverty-related diseases. Um, uh, if you look at the violence, at the refugees which we have uh, nowadays, at, at the destruction of the environment, not to talk about the climate change, we have to simply say this is a world which is unacceptable. And, um, and therefore, uh, there is a need to develop a new paradigm of governance. And um, now I come to the question of corruption, because corruption was one uh, element of this poor governance. The, uh, when I worked uh, as director of the East Africa uh, office in Nairobi of the World Bank, uh, I observed how uh, many countries were unable to do something about grand corruption. Some of them were unable to do it, some of them were unwilling to do something about it. Um, uh, the countries like Germany, like the UK, like uh, France, like Japan, they didn't want to do anything against corruption because they felt against international corruption. Because they felt um, in a globalized uh, economy where there is no uh, sound and effective governance, everybody has to fend for themselves. And uh, therefore, since everybody else was bribing, uh, the Germans allowed the German companies to go out of the borders of Germany and bribe systematically not uh, telling, giving a thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars or one million dollar to a, say, African uh, president or minister. No, they gave 10 million dollars, 20, 30, 50 million dollars, put them on Swiss bank accounts and bank accounts of other tax havens where um, uh, they then uh, thought they couldn't be discovered. And in return, they got hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of dollars of contracts, very often contracts for very bad projects, projects which were destroying um, the economy and the world in which we live. So this was a reality which I saw when I was there. And when I talked to people, say, from Germany, and I said, uh, in Germany, you, you don't allow people to bribe. But here in, uh, in Kenya, when uh, a German company comes and, and uh, bribes a minister, you even give them a tax write-off. You even subsidize their corruption in these countries uh, by uh, insuring them through Hermes and through other uh, government uh, uh, support uh, facilities. So that was the world which we found at that time. And, um, uh, and therefore, I proposed that the World Bank, which had a lot of conditionalities, had a lot of ideas on how to strengthen economic policy in its member countries, um, and had a lot of tools to also uh, implement these policies, um, I thought it's up to the World Bank to develop a systemic approach uh, to fight corruption. A systemic approach with holistic, um, as you mentioned it, uh, earlier, uh, which is the approach here in this, in this country right now. And um, I began to put together a team of people who wanted to do this with me. But um, uh, no sooner had I started to interact with a task force of about 10 people with whom I uh, had decided to, to start this, uh, I received a memorandum from the World Bank in which they said what you are doing is illegal. It uh, violates our policies. Uh, it mingles in the internal affairs of our countries and our member countries in Africa and Latin America and Asia. And therefore, we want you to stop that immediately. So I said, in that case, I will do this in my own time. I will do that after five when I am a, a private person and uh, continued to build up this idea on how one can systemically 
uh, fight corruption, not, not necessarily expose individuals and shame them and bring them to, to justice, but uh, try to look uh, where the um, weaknesses of the integrity systems are and then uh, try to address those, uh, very much like um, Ms. Nikolova has, has uh, described earlier. And uh, uh, we began this, and about two weeks later, I received uh, a phone call from the president of the World Bank, um, Mr. Conoval, and he said, as long as you are a director at the World Bank, you're not allowed to do this. This is totally uh, out of uh, order, and it is embarrassing, the sort of romantic, do-gooder stuff. This is not something for a director of the World Bank to get in, in, involved in. So this is when I left the bank, and I must say, when I then came back to Germany, this was 1990, 1991, and I began to promote this idea further in Germany. I was told by the German government, we cannot stop German business to bribe outside Germany, to bribe in, in Kenya or in Bulgaria or in China, uh, because everybody else is doing. So uh, this is impossible to do something about this. So, th so this was the sort of the invisible hand, not of Adam Smith, but the invisible hand of uh, the globalized economy, which had run havoc, had escaped basically the control, the supervision, the regulation of, uh, of society. And um, not only the German government at the time said this, uh, but also the business community, uh, also um, academia and, and universities. I remember there was one professor of business ethics uh, in a Frankfurt university. Um, who said, uh, who are we to impose our sort of Judeo-Christian values on other societies only because we want to do business there? If we go to Indonesia, if we go to China, if we go to Nigeria, we have to do as is customary under their value system, not under ours. And therefore, um, he was defending foreign bribery of German companies. In fact, this was a, a Jesuit professor at, uh, for, for business ethics who was writing books about this, how um, this has to be accepted. And the same thing is true basically in all of the OECD countries at the time, except the United States, which had introduced a uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in 1977 under this romantic, under this value-driven president, uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, many people said he's naive, you know, uh, and German, um, and the, the American community. Uh, of course expected that other countries, other civilized countries, would follow their example, but far from it. Uh, the German, the French, and the British, and the Japanese, and Canadian business people, they were uh, gloating over the fact that their competitors from the United States were not allowed to bribe people, uh, decision makers in the countries, and they continued systematically with the support of their government, with the support of their societies, with the support of academia, um, uh, continued their systematic bribery of decision makers worldwide. Now, um, this is uh, a shameful uh, period in, in our history, and, uh, but it is, uh, in my opinion, very indicative of the fact that um, global, uh, the global economy has created dilemmas for uh, national governments or for us uh, relying on national governments and their international institutions. Uh, which um, uh, are very, very hard to solve. Uh, there comes then a small NGO. Uh, in 1993, exactly, uh, we set up Transparency International. We were really a very small group of people. Some of them were my former colleagues from the World Bank. Some of them were um, rather enlightened young people from Africa or from Latin America and so on. And we began to put our heads together to, to see what can a small civil society organization do to change this. And, um, and we very quickly came up with uh, three principles which still are guiding uh, the work of Transparency International. I mean, the first principle was that we should not try to preach honesty and integrity and so on from Berlin, where the Secretariat of Transparency International was established. We should empower civil society in participating countries, in the countries which felt that they have a corruption problem, uh, to help them uh, to gain uh, the professional independence to uh, diagnose their own corruption problem, 
uh, to make proposals on how to deal uh, with these problems and then hopefully um, uh, create alliances in their own societies with their own governments, with their own private sector, in which they would uh, together uh, propose uh, reforms and introduce these reforms and implement them and monitor uh, their success. So that was the first principle which we had. But from this flows, of course, the idea that you don't um, uh, operate like, say, uh, um, Amnesty International does uh, in investigating individual cases of uh, human rights violations and then um, accuse them and shame them and investigate them and bring people to, uh, to justice. No, we thought we have to find a way in which we bring civil society in, in, into a constructive working relationship with governments, even if the governments are corrupt, and with companies, even if the companies are corrupt. Uh, and to find uh, enlightened people in these other uh, organizations, because corruption, in particular grand corruption in the international marketplace, is so complex that you only can deal with it if you really understand it, and you can only really understand it if you work with the governments which are affected by it, if you find some honest people who are interested to help, uh, if you work with the companies, because very often companies, in particular in Germany, uh, are uh, very unhappy with the need to bribe in the international marketplace. They much rather compete in a corruption-free market because they have high quality, good prices, reliable delivery, and therefore you can really find allies both in the public sector and the private sector. And this is what we started at the time. And um, therefore, the second principle was that we are not ourselves uh, going to investigate corruption cases uh, to bring them to justice. But we rather focus on weaknesses of um, the integrity system in the country, uh, which uh, is mainly focused on, on prevention, of course. Uh, it also includes uh, criminal sanctions, but it's only one, uh, one uh, uh, weapon in the fight against corruption, and it's not the main weapon. Uh, to the contrary, I mean, criminal sanctions are normally quite uh, blunt, um, because uh, in particular in a democracy you have to observe all kinds of legal protections, uh, the presumption of innocence, for instance, uh, before you can punish people under criminal law but many other aspects uh, of uh, setting incentives for honesty are much more effective in, in most societies. So this was for us uh, then the, um, the, the, the third important element of our approach was this holistic approach, looking at integrity systems, as we called it. And in fact, it was um, in the beginning a rather simplistic approach. It was like a, a cookbook uh, where we set up uh, checklists of the various elements of an integrity system, like procurement, like uh, how to deal with conflict of interest, uh, how you uh, get uh, government information, access to information um, uh, of the government, how you deal with uh, corruption in hiring and firing, how you deal with um, trading, with influence, so many, many different elements in their totality make up, uh, like a mosaic, uh, the uh, integrity system which can protect society against corruption. So with these three um, uh, ideas, I mean, first of all, uh, decentralization into the countries which, uh, which have to do the work, into the societies which have to do the work. Today we have 110 chapters. Um, we have a big office in Berlin, uh, but we support these societies. We have 180 staff members by now in our Berlin um, uh, Secretariat, but they see their role as a service to these 110. Secondly, um, the attempt to develop a uh, constructive and effective working relationship, an independent working relationship with the other actors, in particular civil society and gov uh, in particular private sector and government. And then thirdly, um, the holistic approach to fighting corruption. Now that was our approach and in an amazing way it, it worked. I mean, we were told as late as 1995, 1996, that it's totally impossible what you're trying to do, to get, for instance, the OECD countries, the rich countries, to get them to stop their own exporters, their own nationals, their investors from bribing outside their borders. 
This would be totally impossible, we were told. And uh, in a way, uh, it has happened. Um, we, perhaps I can briefly tell you how it actually happened. We organized uh, meetings at the Aspen Institute on the Wannsee in Berlin with about 20 business leaders from Germany and uh, German-speaking business leaders also from Austria and, and Switzerland. And we discussed with them uh, why they thought corruption was necessary in the, in the, in the international marketplace. And in fact, the first meeting was uh, chaired by Richard von Weizsäcker, who had just ended his presidency in Germany. Uh, it's funny, but uh, the companies were afraid of civil society. They thought they discussed with us, and then we turn around and shame them later and, and run a campaign against them. And so Richard von Weizsäcker was to guarantee that this was a professional meeting <coughs> focused on, on substance rather than on um, uh, one upsmanship. And we had three meetings like that uh, in the course of two years. And in the last meeting, uh, the participants of the meeting, these were top people from Siemens, from Daimler Chrysler, from Lufthansa, from RBB, uh, from MIN, many of the really most respectable companies in Germany. The first meeting they said, we are not bribing. What we are doing is just uh, what these people like. You know, in Indonesia, they like to be bribed. Uh, we don't call it bribing. They don't call it bribing. We just give somebody uh, a representative $50 million, and he can do with it what he wants, uh, as long as he brings us $500 million worth of, of uh, contracts. Um, so at the end of the first meeting, we were pretty hostile to each other. In the second meeting, they said, uh, yeah, what uh, we are doing in these other countries we would never do in our own countries, because here people would call it bribing. So um, uh, therefore, yeah, I mean, maybe it is damaging, but it's necessary, because uh, there is no global governance. And therefore, this is what we have to do. And this is why we, the Germans, are the world champions of exports, while we are doing it so well. And um, in the third meeting, they came to us and said, we would love to stop, but we cannot. We are, we are caught in a prisoner's dilemma, because the first um, actors who suddenly don't bribe, they lose all their business in China, in Nigeria, in Russia, and so on, in Bulgaria. So um, uh, this was uh, the situation we found. But in the, f in the third meeting, we basically developed a system which we are still applying right now, where we said we try to get everybody to stop bribing simultaneously. Um, we, uh, this is called collective action, where uh, we make sure that your competitors in a given competitive situation, say a World Bank, um, uh, procurement system for a big pipeline or a port or, or uh, a railway and so on, where we very often have only five or ten uh, pre-qualified uh, bidders. We make sure that all of them promise in a legally binding way not to bribe, to stop bribing simultaneously. And we, as Transparency International, we monitor this. this uh, we call that at the time the island of integrity approach. Uh, now we, uh, we call it the integrity pact. This is now applied in hundreds and hundreds of uh, countries, and I think also here in uh, Bulgaria it has been used, this concept. And when Siemens, for instance, when they heard that this is what we are doing, they said, if you can achieve this, that the others stop arriving at the same time, then we will support you. And it was at that stage that we accepted Siemens as a corporate member and so on, uh, which later became uh, a bit of a problem for us. But um, this is how we uh, then got the cooperation of the companies. And they wrote an open letter uh, in uh, the spring of 1997 to the coal government in which they said, please participate in an effort of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, to, uh, to stop foreign bribery. Uh, the OECD had been working on this for years uh, with our support but always thinking of a recommendation to the member countries of the OECD. But the Germans said, we don't want a recommendation. If we participate, we want this to be a binding convention, because the Germans hate the arm twisting uh, by the Americans. You know? And uh, if it's sort of a voluntary thing, this invites to a number of countries not, uh, ex not performing, and, uh, and the Germans then being forced uh, by their American friends and some others 
through arm twisting, international arm twisting, to behave like good Germans. And so they didn't like it. They said, we want to have a convention. And in the fall of 1997, great miracle still in my, my mind, um, the OECD convention against foreign bribery was signed in Paris. And uh, all member countries of the OECD signed, and a few other exporting nations. And, uh, and in fact, it entered into force in the spring of 1999. And this was an absolute sea change in our anti-corruption battle. I'm telling you this um, so um, in detail because it gives you a sense on how organized civil society uh, organizations um, uh, work. I mean, we don't have power. We cannot send cannonballs somewhere. Uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, we don't have a security council like the UN. We, we have to convince people to work with us. And this is exactly what has happened in fighting uh, corruption. And of course, most of you know the, uh, the results. By now, practically all organizations, including the leadership of the World Bank, but also the United Nations, European Union, uh, European Union was one of the first to join us um, because um, they had renegotiated the Lomé Convention and they introduced an anti-corruption clause in this. But a few years later, particularly after the OECD Convention has entered into force, um, most of the other international organizations and nations and companies began to join us. And then, of course, early um, in this millennium, uh, the, um, the UN Convention against bribery was, uh, was drafted and was signed in Merida in Mexico. And by now, um, most of the signatory states, have, including Germany, have um, ratified the uh, UN Convention Against Bribery. So it has become basically the uh, common agreement of the world community that bribery, that foreign bribery, domestic bribery, grand corruption, petty corruption, all of these things are absolutely damaging and have to be changed. Now, we are, of course, very proud of this, and uh, we are very pleased that this has happened. And, uh, but my message to you today is that this has only been possible because uh, a civil society organization, which is not bound by these three um, this, uh, uh, this, uh, asymmetries, which I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, most civil society organizations work across borders. They work across uh, 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 the time span of, uh, of demo democratic uh, election cycles. Uh, they uh, have um, issues which, are, which they have to defend, which they have to sell uh, in, a, in a community which has lost its confidence in many governments, which has lost its confidence in the, in the private sector. Um, uh, therefore, civil society can come in there and create credibility, legitimacy. Legitimacy is a word which uh, perhaps I should say a, a few sentences about because uh, most people say an NGO, a civil society organization, doesn't really have legitimacy. They are not elected by anybody uh, who has authorized them to speak on, on behalf of the millions and billions of poor in the world and so on. And there I would like to distinguish, in particular at a university, there are a lot of political scientists around, uh, one has to distinguish between input legitimacy and output leg leg legitimacy. Uh, input legitimacy is if you have a process which leads through elections and through other processes to a uh, capacity of representatives to um, speak with, with legitimacy for the others. But the output leg legitimacy arises from the product of uh, organizations. If uh, this product is accepted, if um, uh, one convinces society that um, uh, they should follow these ideas, that if they finance uh, NGOs, as uh, they do with Amnesty International, or with Greenpeace, or, or with Transparency International, then out of this comes uh, what we call output legitimacy. And I feel uh, what we managed to create with Transparency International at the time was a, a tremendous uh, acceptance, credibility, and relief of uh, society that we were able to um, uh, escape this 
prisoner's dilemma in uh, which they found themselves um, through this poor global governance. Now, my theory is, my conviction is, that you can apply this in many different areas, not only in fighting corruption. For instance, we are now uh, proposing in a uh, Humboldt Viadrina governance platform, we have spent most of my time present, uh, at present, uh, we are creating a transparency system for the fishery sector because we see that hundreds of countries are robbed of their fisheries um, uh, stock by international uh, fishing fleets, you know, trawlers and fishing um, uh, factories practically, swimming factories uh, up and down the west coast of, and east coast of Africa so that the local fisheries um, uh, community uh, cannot survive. Um, so we have been asked by Mauritania, by Senegal, by Seychelles to create a fisheries transparency system, a system in which the various actors in that sector who have an interest in sustainable and fair development of the fisheries sector can uh, work together to uh, develop standards and to pursue these standards together. Same thing uh, since about two years since the Rana Plaza accident in Bangladesh. We are working on a garment industry transparency initiative where we try to bring together the, uh, the factory owners, the about 6,000 factories in, in, in Bangladesh where about six, seven million people are working right now under terrible working conditions with terrible insecurity and uh, very poorly paid slave-like situations. Uh, to protect them against accidents like Rana Plaza, where two years ago about 1,500 um, uh, textile workers died. And uh, we find a lot of interest in uh, even um, the European importing companies to support this because they are embarrassed that their sourcing of their cheap textile, but also expensive textiles, uh, are, um, is, is creating a reputational risk for them. So they work with us, the factory owners work with us, the labor unions in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Ethiopia. Um, uh, the governments in these countries who have recognized how important uh, a good reputation is for their, uh, for their sector, which is extremely important for the generation of, uh, of revenues. Um, all of them are interested to work together in this uh, sort of magical triangle of interaction between government, civil society, and private sector to enforce the, um, uh, the labor standards, but also other standards of, uh, of sound uh, production in the textile sector uh, on the same basis as we are fighting corruption um, uh, with Transparency International. About 10 years ago, I helped um, set up an organization to do the same thing in the oil and gas sector, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. There we have by now 48 um, uh, resource-rich countries which are applying uh, to a system of regular reporting of uh, payments, for instance, of uh, oil and gas and mining companies to their host countries every year so that for the first time the media in, say, in Nigeria or the legislators in their parliament or the civil society organizations know how much money is made by the power elite in Nigeria from oil and gas. I'm sure nobody in this room uh, can imagine how much money is taken in in royalties, taxes, dividends and so on by the Nigerian government from oil and gas. Um, it is more than $50 billion every year. Not $50 million, $50 billion. This is more than the whole development program for the whole of Africa. This is more than the whole lending program of the World Bank. 50, more than last year, $54 billion on oil and gas and, and dividends, which are being collected by a power elite uh, in a country where about half of the people live below the poverty line. And uh, last year, they found out that 20, 20 billion was missing. The, the governor of the central bank in Nigeria said 20 billion, 23 billion are missing. 
And the president said, no, 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 uh, it's only six billion which is missing. And the minister of finance said, no, we calculated it is uh, 16 billion which is missing. Billion, I mean, this is an amazing situation. And, uh, and that was the rule in, uh, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, in these uh, oil and gas and mining rich countries, in which very often even the minister of finance didn't know how much money uh, was collected by, say, a state company, a state oil company, uh, and shared with the president and his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, clique. And it's even today, for instance, in Angola, uh, these numbers are unknown, and therefore open the door uh, to grand corruption, to grand plunder of these resources. And, um, and therefore, um, uh, the extractive industry transparency initiative is an amazing step forward through transparency and how by bringing together the governments, both from the rich countries but also from the producing countries, uh, the uh, companies um, and, uh, uh, and civil society. Uh, about 400 NGOs uh, together elect one third of the board, uh, which I chaired for the first five years, um, to uh, work with the companies, about 80 companies, uh, big ones, uh, like Exxon and Anglo American and Shell and Total, um, and, um, and about 70 governments. Now, this is uh, the, the magic of, first of all, the uh, interaction between civil society, private sector, and government, but also the magic of transparency. Well, I uh, could now go on and tell you about the tools which we use uh, at Transparency International. I could uh, tell you much more about um, what we learn in many parts of the world by applying certain legislative, institutional, and other arrangements in order to fight corruption. But maybe we should leave this to the discussion afterwards. Um, what I would like to simply say in conclusion is, uh, yes, we are faced with a system of failing governance for the globalized economy. And um, in my opinion, one of the very promising uh, solutions uh, which can be, uh, can, can be approached is empowerment of organized civil society, empowerment of, of civil society to play a um, constructive role as one of the three main uh, actors of global, global governance. Of course, civil society organizations have to also do quite a, a lot in order to grow into that role. Uh, civil society organizations have to be much more um, uh, uh, open themselves. Their own governance is very often opaque. They have to publish where do they get their money from. Uh, what is their own governance? Do they have a modicum of participatory governance or are they simply the product of, of one oligarch or so who is putting up a one-person NGO uh, pretend to pursue the public interest, but in reality uh, only pursuing his or her own. Um, civil society has, in my opinion, also be, to become much more competent. And this is sort of a challenge for universities like this one here. Uh, one should have a focus on uh, training the leadership of civil society organizations. Most universities, they train good civil servants and they train good managers for the private sector. But um, that civil society is playing a role which is uh, as uh, powerful and as important as we see it evolving right now. I mean, after all, uh, some of the NGOs uh, in London, for instance, Save the Children or Care or Greenpeace, they have uh, an annual budget of a billion uh, pounds sterling. I mean, they have thousands of employees all over the world. Um, so they have to be managed, they have to be run in a professional, in a responsible way, just as, uh, as a big multinational corporation. But then, and, uh, and I hope you get the sense of the difficulty of this last challenge for civil society, they have to learn how to act closely with the other uh, actors, with the establishment, with governments, with the World Bank, with the UN, with um, uh, private companies. Siemens of this world, the Exxons of this world, 
um, uh, without losing their independence, without losing their credibility. My wife, very, who also, by the way, spoke in this room here before, Gesine Schwan, she calls this in her writings the antagonistic cooperation between these actors. But it is an amazing uh, rela uh, relationship uh, between government, civil society, and private sector, uh, which can bring out these uh, great results, both in the diagnostic of the problems of global governance, in the development of reforms, and implement, uh, implementation of these reforms. And my personal creed is that um, if they grow into this role and if they are welcomed by government, like the European Union welcomes many governments, welcome civil society, World Bank, um, the uh, United Nations welcomes civil society to the table. If this continues, this can be a tremendous um, uh, promise for a world which is more just and more sustainable and more peaceful than what we have now. Thank you.